This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature, let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another, or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to false views, the pure-hearted one having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> okay. Over to you, Ajahn. Thank you. So, uh, nice to see you all again. I hope you're all keeping well. And we are now, as you will know, we are kind of still sort of in the Vesak season. And so I'm going to talk a little bit later on, a little bit more about the Buddha, because the Buddha is always, always inspiring, always interesting, always something that comes a lot, comes out of just contemplating the life of the Buddha and understanding what he was on about, how he thought about life, how he approached the idea of awakening, how he approached meditation practice, how he thought about the world. All of these things are very, very interesting and they give an insight into how we should practice and live our lives and it also gives an insight into how we go about meditation practice. And so I will talk a little bit about meditation first of all, not very much because usually I think we should probably just, we can often just get into it, uh, but just some very simple ideas. Uh, and uh, one way of thinking about meditation uh, is in terms of three different words. Uh, yeah, three words that kind of summarize the various qualities of mind that we try to develop. Uh, and these uh, three qualities are on the one hand letting go. Yeah, letting go is used so often in meditation, but it also it is actually very important. So I will talk a little bit about that very briefly. 
Uh, second one is the enjoyment part of meditation, letting go, enjoyment. Uh, and the last one is mindfulness. Uh, and uh, what you find that is very interesting uh, is that these three qualities very often come together. Uh, they're not really so much different qualities as different aspects of the same quality, different angles from which to understand a certain, uh, a certain, uh, a certain mind state, if you like, a certain way of thinking about or being in the world. Uh, but very often it is useful to start, when we meditate, to start with the idea of letting go. Uh, and the reason for that is because when we come to our meditation, uh, very often the mind is quite active. Uh, we come with a lot of activity from our daily lives. Yeah, we come to sit down or whatever. Uh, and all that activity, all that thinking in the mind, uh, even the drowsiness that we may have, uh, all the things that are go is going on, uh, all of that comes from the fact that we are holding on, uh, comes from the fact of doing activity. Doing in activity is a kind of holding on, where you are forcing the mind in a certain way. Uh, and so just the very act of sitting down and being peaceful is in itself an act of letting go. If you feel, for example, when you sit down that you are not really 100% relaxed, you feel maybe some tension somewhere, you feel some lack of, you can't really relax properly, you feel that the body is not comfortable, all of that comes from a lack of letting go. It is a holding on. The mind is holding on. And because the mind is holding on, the body feels the results. And that is in many ways quite useful. Because if you can feel the results of holding on in the body, it means that you have a way of ascertaining whether you are whether you have let go or not, right? You know if you are not comfortable, you haven't really let go properly. And so it tells you that you need to let go. And so what do we then do to let go? Well, most of the time you just uh, take a few deep breaths, uh, you uh, give yourself time, you uh, uh, incline the mind towards the peace because you know that is where real happiness is found. And as you do this very simply, and you are patient at the same time, gradually it all starts to letting go happens by itself. It is not something that you do merely by inclining the mind in that way, letting go happens. And then you start to become more relaxed. You become more at ease. Yeah, and uh, you will notice that that is already a benefit of meditation. The deeper your meditation goes, uh, the more at ease and the more relaxed you feel. And this is one of the reasons why meditation is, is pleasant when you get it right. Get it wrong, and it is anti-pleasant. Anti-pleasant, uh, uncomfortable, yeah, <laughs> or whatever it might be. It is anti-pleasant and it shows you the reason is because we are holding on even more. And a lot of people do this in their meditation. They grasp the breath or they grasp onto something. They hold on more and they become more tense, more unrelaxed, more uncomfortable. And this is, shows you that actually meditation is going in the wrong way because it's supposed to be a state of ease, a state of relaxation. And so this is how you know that you're letting go. And you know that you're going to the breath too quickly. If going to the breath means that you have to grasp the breath and you feel uncomfortable, you know that actually something is going wrong. Let go of the breath again. Don't hold on to it because it's not doing the job that it's supposed to do. The breath is supposed to be delightful, beautiful, comfortable, making you feel at ease. That is the kind of breath that you really want. And so we take this idea of letting go as far as we can. Yeah? And we let go, we kind of find the ease and the mind hopefully starts to calm down. Sometimes the mind never calms down because sometimes the, you know, the activities of the day or the problems we have are so strong that the momentum of the mind is so powerful, it's very hard to calm down. If that happens, don't still don't try to make the mind peaceful. Instead, try just to observe the mind, observe the activity in the mind. Because observation is a kind of letting go. Observation means you're not feeding the mind anymore. Observation means that you actually are letting go to some extent. So sometimes the mind is out of control. It's actually always out of control, but sometimes it's more out of control than other times. Sometimes it feels like it's really out of control. And that's okay too. Yeah, it's important that we don't despair and think that we, it is our job to 
get this mind reined in and tame it like a wild animal or whatever. It is, this is not a good idea. We use carrots in Buddhism, we don't use sticks because sticks don't really work in meditation practice. And so uh, in this way, yeah, by letting go in this way, whether it is becoming peaceful or not, uh, if it is not peaceful, you stay with a lack of peace, you stay with a thinking mind. Uh, but if it does become a little peaceful, uh, that is when you can start to take the next stage, if you like. Uh, I'm calling it stages. It's, not, it's very fluid. Yeah? It's not really proper stages. The one thing flows into the other one, but it can be a useful kind of teaching a way of thinking about meditation, or thinking of it as stages, if you like. Yeah. And the next one is to make sure you enjoy the meditation. Yeah? You kind of put your mind in the right frame, frame so that it feels like you're doing something useful. It feels like you, are, you, know, you, you have a sense of enjoyment as to the meditation practice. Uh, you delight in having the Buddha as your teacher. Yeah, every one of you has the Buddha as the teacher. Isn't that amazing? The Buddha, for goodness sake, is the greatest spiritual genius in the world. The person who found the meaning of life, the most profound peace and happiness that is available. He discovered this and gave it to us. This is your teacher. Yeah, and just that idea that we have these teachers in the world that have discovered more than the humdrum realities of life, that such people exist, is just awesome. <laughs> you know, it's just really, really powerful. And just getting this idea that there are such people in the world, still today there are people who get really deep meditation. Just hearing that kind of lifts up the heart and makes you feel more glad. And because then it also gives you that confidence that this path actually works, etc., etc. Joy, whatever you can find the joy, whether it is in the Buddha as a person, it is in the Dhamma as a teaching, it is in other teachers, it is in your, our community of Kalyanamittas, it is in our generosity, wherever it is found, lift up your heart yeah, and then bring that gladness into the meditation. And then it becomes far more beautiful as a consequence. And then when you bring the idea of letting go, a simple letting go like this, you bring that together with a sense of uplift in the mind, the mind feeling glad, then mindfulness really starts to become strong. Yeah, mindfulness happens. And the reason why mindfulness happens is because you are letting go of those things that happen to be the future and the past. You are letting go, you have a positive mind, it's pleasant to be here. And then mindfulness happens. And then when mindfulness happens, that is where you can really start to follow a meditation object, like the breath or whatever else. So do things wisely. Yeah, don't investigate your experience of meditation. And as you investigate it, you start to learn how to do things. Don't be blind. Don't just do things blindly. Don't think there is a recipe and if you just follow that recipe, then you, everything will be fine. Probably not. Recipes are usually a bad idea because we're all slightly different. So use your own wisdom to understand what is going on. The Buddha always gives very general guidance to meditation. And there is a reason for that. And the reason is uh, we all need to adapt uh, that guidance uh, to our own situation and who we are. Uh. So enough talking. Let's uh, do some meditation together here.
Okay, everyone, so uh, as we start out, uh, always start out by just feeling uh, your present uh, body, your mind as it is now, uh, and just feeling if there are any problems, just understanding your state of mind and state of body. Uh, and this gives you a lot of information, and usually the information it tells you is that you need to let go a little bit, that there is things are not 100% comfortable, uh, and now is the time to find that comfort. Uh, so just start out by being patient, uh, being gentle and kind towards yourself, uh, and allowing yourself to settle down properly, uh, allowing the past to kind of gradually fade away. Uh, and the future is not yet here, so no need to think of that. Uh, and then just uh, enjoy this beautiful time together, uh, sitting peacefully here. Uh. And just gradually allow things to fade away. Uh, give yourself time, uh, be patient. Uh, this happens according to its own cause and conditions. Uh, and very often it's just a matter of waiting, uh, allowing things to fade away, uh, allowing yourself to let go. Uh, and a little bit of nudging of the mind can be useful, uh, reminding yourself that uh, the meaning of life is found here, it is not found in the world outside. This is what really matters, everything else is really secondary. This is where you find the, all the results of the path that the Buddha was talking about. So make meditation important, understand that this is what really matters in life, and then it becomes so much easier to leave everything else behind.
And uh, when you start to feel a little bit of the peace of meditation, uh, and you want to add a little bit of oomph, a little bit of power, a little bit of joy, uh, then try to use one of these many ways the Buddha recommends to give rise to joy. Uh, and one of the ways is uh, simply to have a bit of gratitude, uh, a gratitude to all the uh, positive things in your life, uh, all the blessings in your life, if you like, uh, starting with uh, having the Buddha as a teacher, uh, uh, having the Dhamma available in the world, uh, having people who still practice these teachings uh, in a profound way, uh, uh, that the fact that you have found these teachings, uh, that you're part of this amazing community of people uh, who practice in this way, uh, there is so much to be grateful for once you start to see these things in the right way. Uh, so bring some of that up in your mind uh, and see if you can give rise to this uh, beautiful sense of gratitude for having something really awesome uh, in this life. Uh. And uh, then you can just gradually use these two levers, if you like, of joy and letting go, uh, positivity and leaving things behind. Uh, use these two perceptions very gently uh, to lead the mind towards mindfulness. Uh, and when the mindfulness reaches a certain threshold, a certain level, uh, where you feel at ease and a degree of clarity, uh, only then should you really move on to the breath, for example. Uh, knowing the right time is so important. Uh, 
And in the meantime, we work with these basic ideas to gently guide the mind uh, towards uh, that goal of mindfulness. Uh,
Okay, <clears throat> everyone, so please now just take a minute just to review the meditation here today uh, and just to understand uh, what it is that gives uh, rise to good qualities uh, and what also gives rise to bad qualities of mind. Uh, how do you have to use the mind to improve the meditation? Uh, how do you need to reflect? How do you need to let go? Uh, what do these things actually mean? Uh, Okay, okay, everyone. So, uh, shall I just just start, Chris, or do you want to say something, or? Uh? Uh, yes, if you would just like to start from a further talk, if you would like that, yeah, that'd be wonderful. Excellent. And uh, if you have any questions about the meditation or anything, we can take those at the end as well. After we have, uh, after I have just uh, said a few things about the Buddha. And uh, as I said at the beginning, I want to talk a little bit about the life of the Buddha and about uh, who the Buddha was. And, uh, and in particular, I want to look at how maybe we can emulate the Buddha, what we can learn from his life uh, and how we can kind of maybe improve our own practice uh, as a consequence of understanding the Buddha uh, better. Uh, and one of the, um, to me, always one of the most interesting things about the Buddha was that I reckon that what he did uh, was he discovered the meaning of life itself. Uh, that's what I understand the teaching of the Buddha. Uh, and uh, that is very powerful. Uh, yeah, it is one of those extraordinary things you uh, sometimes you wonder about the meaning of life. I was always like that when I was young. I was always thinking about my existence. What is this about? Uh, so I probably have a habit from past lives of thinking about these things. Uh, maybe that's why I'm a Buddhist monk now. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, um, and uh, the, um, so life seems so strange, right? You get born into this world, you go through the, these things, you get an education, you grow up with your parents, eventually maybe you get married or, or whatever, and then you become a pensioner, and then you die. And then you think, why? <laughs> What was all of this about? Does it have any purpose? Does it have any meaning? Am I doing this just because my parents did it? Am I doing it because my grandparents did it? Am I doing it because of the expectations of society? Am I doing it because I'm incapable of thinking for myself? What is this all about? And it's, so the whole thing seems very strange. And sometimes it can seem very meaningless. And we know that meaning is one of the most important things, to make life bearable, to make life happy, to make life pleasant. And we know that people who have gone through very difficult times, yeah, people in concentration camps, uh, people in very, very difficult circumstances, uh, they were able to carry on, to keep on going, uh, if they had a sense of meaning. Uh, there's a very famous uh, book by this uh, uh, I think all I think it was Austrian Viktor Frankl who, who talks about the, the search of meaning and how meaning is a, is a profound thing that enables people to go through very very difficult times. Uh, and so, if we can uh, discover not just meaning, I mean the practice of Buddhism gives meaning in a very general sense, uh, not just meaning but the ultimate meaning. Uh, that is what the Buddha is said to have discovered: the highest meaning possible. Uh, then we are also adding the highest kind of potential to human life. Uh, yeah, we really, there's really something extraordinary about that. Uh, we know how religious people, uh, philosophers, spiritual seekers have sought meaning uh, through the millennia, through the centuries, uh, and very rarely do they claim to find it. Uh, 
But in, in, uh, from a Buddhist point of view, what the Buddha found is actually the highest meaning or the meaning itself of existence, which is kind of extraordinary here. And so our question then becomes, how can we emulate that? How can we discover the same meaning here? And I think that very often the best way to uh, look at this uh, is to reflect on the life, not of the life of the Buddha, but of the life of the Buddha to be here. In other words, how uh, before he reached his awakening experience, what he did to get there. Because that is exactly what we should be doing. We should emulate the Buddha. We should follow in his footsteps. Yeah, so this is, uh, becomes very interesting. And because this is still the Vesak season, uh, and uh, I've just come back from overseas and been giving heaps of talks overseas about the Buddha, I thought I might as well continue talking about the Buddha tonight. Uh, so this is kind of the idea here. Yeah. And uh, one of the uh, great suttas that talk about the uh, Buddha to be and how he reached awakening yeah, is called the Sutta of the Noble Search. Yeah, the noble search. You can see why that fits with the search for awakening, yeah, the search for meaning and all of these kind of things. Uh, the noble search found in the Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length sayings of the Buddha. And in this uh, sutta, uh, the Buddha starts from the very beginning, uh, yeah, the very start of his life, uh, and then shows the path to awakening and how he actually discovered this. Uh, and... Um, uh, where he starts out uh, is basically where he starts to reflect on the realities of, exi of existence, the realities of life. Uh, yeah? And this, uh, these realities of life, reflecting on those, uh, is actually what makes the Buddha go forth and become a monk to start out on the spiritual path. Uh, and so what are these realities that the Buddha reflects on? Uh? And you probably know the answer to this already, at least some of you will. And those realities are, of course, the realities of old age, illness and death. Yeah, these are kind of the core things that the Buddha is reflecting on. And reflecting on those deeply yeah, actually is what made the Buddha go forth. So one of the questions we have to ask is how can we reflect on these realities of life to make them really meaningful, to make it really powerful, so we also can go forth, right? So that when you have read the sutta, you want to go forth, you want to become a monk, or you, you, if you have the opportunity, because you think, wow, this is so important. How can we make this so powerful that it actually inclines you towards the spiritual path more fully? If you can't become a monk or a nun, well, at least you can incline more in the spiritual practice. How can we use these things? And one of the interesting things about the way the Buddha contemplated this is that he didn't start with the idea of sickness, old age and death. He started somewhere else. What is that somewhere else? He started with the idea of rebirth. Rebirth comes first. Yeah, and that is kind of really interesting because rebirth coming first, it means that all these things that follow after it, the sickness, the old age and death and all of these things, they are only a problem if there is already rebirth. It is rebirth that makes this whole thing really, really problematic and then gives you the idea that you want to search for an end to all of these issues in life, all of these problems in life. And because once you have rebirth, you don't just have death, but you have re-death. Once you have rebirth, you don't just have old age, you have re-old age. Once you have rebirth, you have re-everything. And not just re, but you also have re-re. And you have re-re-re. And you have re-re-re-re-re. Re, and so it goes on and on and on. And after a while, you recognize, actually, this is not really worthwhile. I have to find a way out of this. This is fundamentally problematic. And so it is rebirth that gives that sense of power to the contemplation of these realities of life. So how can we contemplate these realities of life? I'll just give you some very simple ideas, because I'm going to talk about some other issues as well. But one of the ways, one of the things that we can probably, everyone can contemplate, and the younger you are when you start contemplating these things, the better it is. But an obvious one is just old age. You know, how do we contemplate old age? Well, you see how you change. 
you see that something is happening, you see the first gray hair coming out. I don't know what age you are when the gray hair starts coming out, but probably in maybe your 30s, yeah, early 30s maybe, the first gray hair. I guess it depends a bit on your genetic makeup, etc. <clears throat> You start to see things are getting worse, things are failing a little bit, things are not as good as they used to be. You have to wear glasses, otherwise you can just see a blur. I can actually, right now, I can just see a blur. I'm looking at the screen. You think I'm looking at you. I, actually, all I see is a blur. Okay, now I can see you. Okay, good. So, <laughs> so uh, but uh, blur is okay. I don't actually mind seeing a blur, but it's a good reminder of old age. And then you get weak, you know, your limbs start not functioning some more, your muscles start to deteriorate, you know, and, and all of these things, old age, can be observed so easily. Yeah. And so one of the things that we should do when you start to see the very first signs of old age, uh, the very first thing to do is not to deny it, uh, yeah, not to say no, but actually take it on board. Uh, actually, this is old age. Uh, the Buddha was right. This is actually happening to me. Uh, it is so easy to kind of turn away from the mirror when you see the first sign of old age, yeah? the first wrinkle appearing, the first gray hair, whatever it might be, not wanting to deal with it. But deal with it, for goodness sake. This is a divine messenger, according to Buddhism. These are called the Deva Dutas. The Devas are the divinities and the Dutas are the messengers. Accept these messengers. They are telling you something about the nature of the world. This is your opportunity to grow wise. Don't waste that opportunity. That is what the Buddha is saying. So take it in. And when you take it in, it has this amazing effect on you. It has this effect of taking away some of the intoxication of life. Yeah. If this is the reality, I'm only in my 30s. Actually, this is a long time ago since I was in my 30s. But you know, if you are in your 30s, I'm only in my 30s. And already things are starting to go wrong with me. Maybe you're late 20s. Yeah, if you catch yourself really early, the first signs of getting older. Or maybe even younger if you're really smart about how you use this. Uh, it's an opportunity to understand the nature of this life. That actually, it is going in one direction only. And then what happens is that this idea of letting go that I was talking about just before in meditation, it happens by itself. Because when you see the downside of life, you let go a little bit of that existence in the five sense world. You let go a little bit about the interest in this physical body. You let go a little bit of interest in all that, and your mind turns automatically towards the spiritual path instead. All you have to do is to accept that reality, not turn away, not think that somehow you can control that reality. This is the sense of self coming in as well. I'm going to control it. I'm going to color my hair. Yeah? I'm going to deny Mara. I'm going to deny that reality. I am much stronger than the reality of old age. Yeah? I'm going to train my muscles. I'm going to color my hair. I'm going to use a bit of Botox. And I'm going to use some makeup. And I'm going to look as if I'm 20, even though I'm 70 years older. <laughs> Please don't do that. Yeah? Because you're actually dealing with a double delusion. First of all, the delusion of denial. Secondly, the delusion that you can control this thing. You cannot control it. This is an opportunity for growing wise. And the more you take these things on board, it's very simple. But if you take it on board like this, actually it turns you towards the spiritual path automatically. This is what the Buddha did. The Buddha had very, obviously, very powerful spiritual qualities. He had very powerful mindfulness, he had powerful stillness of the mind, and so he was able to use these raw data of the world, take it in, and then use it for his uh, spiritual inclination, was really what, what he was about. That's why it was so powerful for the Buddha. You can use exactly the same thing for dying. Yeah, you are dying, and what that means that you are dying, now you can use it in the just think about the accidents that are always possible in life. Every time a car kind of comes a little bit close to you on the street and you think it's dangerous, there are always little things that remind you of death in everyday life. Yeah, it is always around you. It is always put a potential. When you read the newspapers, yeah, read the people who die. Yeah, they are not different from you. This could be you. All of these things are reminders of the reality of death. They're always around us. And again, if you take it on board, if you understand that it could happen to me 
at any time, basically. We have no idea when it's going to happen. Take it on board. Something very beautiful happens. Uh, you gain a degree of clarity of mind. Uh, your world seems much less important because if you could die tomorrow, what does the world matter anyway? Uh, and then the mind turns onto the spiritual path. Uh, now is the opportunity. Now is the chance to do what is right. Uh, if you're lucky, uh, you have a few years. Uh, if you're not lucky, you have much less. You have no idea. And because you have no idea, only now is the time to get on with these things. Uh, and these kind of contemplations become very, very powerful and very interesting. They turn your mind in the right way. There was one more thing, actually a couple of more things that the Buddha reflected on in this particular sutta called the Noble Search. And one of them was the reflection on sorrow. Yeah, sorrow, grief, is an is a integral part of human existence. It's impossible to have a life without any kind of sorrow. Sorrow and grief are very, very painful things. Sometimes we forget when life is going well uh, how painful these things are. Uh, losing someone who is very dear to you, uh, losing something that really means something in your life, yeah, can be incredibly, incredibly painful. And it is integral to your life. Uh, it has to happen sooner or later. Uh, do you really want to bind yourself to all these things in the world? Uh, or do you want to loosen that bondage a little bit uh, so you can reduce the pain that comes from existence? Uh, these are the kind of things that the Buddha to be contemplated. He too was subject to these exactly same things that we are subject to, which is very interesting. Yeah, it puts us, it makes us a kind of, um, uh, uh, it makes us see the Buddha as one of us, which is actually very, very useful. He had exactly the same problems. He had attachments. He had this potential suffering in his life. And one of the, um, Last things the Buddha was talking about was the idea of corruption. Yeah, beings in the world get corrupted. What does that mean that beings get corrupted? We get corrupted. And what it means is that we don't know what our trajectory in this life is going to be. Are we going to become more purified over time? Hopefully, hopefully we're going to become better people with more compassion, more understanding. But sometimes the opposite things happen. We can become worse people. Sometimes the people around us become worse. What happens if you choose a life partner, someone who is very dear to you, and you start out, everything starts out very well, but then they become worse. They become more aggressive, they become more greedy, they become more intolerant. They have stupid views about the world. They become more deluded. This is this, set, this reality that we are all subject to corruption. And this is very painful to watch if people are very close to you. If it is your parents, your children, your spouse, yeah, whoever it might be, people who are really mean a lot to you, and then you see them turning in the wrong direction, becoming worse. But this is the reality of life in the world. People are subject to corruption. We too, individually, are subject to corruption. Unless we stem the danger of the defilements in the mind, unless we do something to counteract that, uh, guarantee the world is going to corrupt us. Uh, this is the nature of the world. It has a corrupting influence. Uh, and so this is uh, the way you reflect on life. And as you reflect on this life, yeah, this is all the Buddha did in a sense. This is all the reflections he did. Uh, and that made him go forth, that made him decide that this is the only right thing to do, to become a monastic, to become a monk, and for many people, at the very least, take the spiritual path incredibly seriously. And then the next thing comes in the Buddha's biography, because I want to talk about some other <coughs> points as well, and that is when he decides to go forth. Yeah, so how does the, how does the Buddha decide to go forth? <coughs> and... Uh, very often, if you have heard the kind of standard way that the Buddha goes forth, he kind of in the middle of the night, he sort of kisses his wife and his son goodbye, and he gets on the horse Kantaka, and he rides off into the night and jumps over the walls of the large city of Kapilavattu and disappears into the, into the darkness, and then becomes a monk, cuts off his hair, cuts off the hair like this, and then becomes a monk. And this is kind of the tra traditional story. But of course, no, that is not actually what happened. What actually happened, as we see it in the, this particular sutta, is that the Buddha then went to his family, yeah, and his family were sad. Yeah, it says that even though his family wished otherwise, they were crying 
You can imagine if you have the Buddha to be as your son, probably a fairly impressive son, right? Here is someone who can maybe become the prime minister of the country, someone who is destined to something magnificent and great. Yeah, and I know that and, you know, very often we want our children to succeed, whatever it is. We want them to kind of be proud of our children, whatever it might be. Yeah? And here he wants to go off. Yeah, it's kind of the nightmare of many, many parents. I know, I, I travel a lot, and I, there are not so many Buddhists in the West, but when I travel to Asia and I suggest to the parents, you should be happy if your son or daughter goes forth. They say, what, are you crazy? Go forth? That's the last thing we want for our child. They should become a lawyer, a doctor, whatever. But uh, if we have one dumb, dumb child, okay, that dumb, dumb child can go forward. But the other ones, uh, they should do something useful in the world. Uh, I tell them, you are... This is wrong. The most useful thing you can do is to become a monastic. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure many of you here agree, agree with this because you have been around for a long time. You have been brainwashed for a long time. So you already agree with this point, I'm sure. Yeah? And if you haven't been brainwashed enough, hang in there and eventually you will be here. Yeah? So this is, <laughs> this is how this works. So uh, the Buddha goes to his parents uh, and he doesn't, instead of just going off, disappearing in the middle of the night, yeah, which seems very irresponsible and very bad, he has a chat to his parents and he says to them, you know, I want to go forth. And then they come to some kind of arrangement and then he goes forth and becomes a monk. And this, of course, is the right way to do it. But you will notice two things here. His parents are crying. So if you are one of those people who wants to go forth, uh, you should expect difficulties. Uh, it is not easy. When we go forth and when we do something unusual with our life, uh, there will be resistance in the world. Uh, our family will, resi will resist, the people around us will be resist, uh, and that's okay. Uh, it doesn't mean we should just toe the line of our parents and our family, because if we do, we never really do anything truly may be inspiring, truly interesting, truly individual. Sometimes it is important to be a bit stubborn. Sometimes it's important to have a mind of your own and to go against the values of society. So just because someone is crying, don't give up because of that. Keep on, keep on at it. When I became a monk, I can tell you my parents were not happy. They were actually very unhappy. And they said, we didn't bring you up to become a Buddhist monk. And I said, well, I may become one anyway, sorry. <laughs> doesn't matter what you brought me up for, that was your ideas. Yeah, I, I had my own ideas. And uh, so eventually I became a monk anyway. Yeah. And now my parents are really happy about that. Yeah, so it was a right choice. And so this is a very important learning point. We should not expect it to be easy. It is difficult to do things that are very, very valuable because very often they go against the norms of society. But when we do it, we should do it responsibly. We should make sure that our parents eventually kind of, okay, they give their assent, they are okay with it, that everyone is going to be okay. Yeah, we should do it in the right way. And when we do it in the right way, then in the future, we will have no regrets when we go forth. And then there's also a chance that maybe your family kind of, or your friends will actually come along on this journey because they know that you actually have done things in the right way. So this is, what, this is actually the truth of the story of the Buddha. It is not. The traditional understanding is completely wrong. And what we find in the suttas is a much more compassionate and responsible Buddha to be. And then when he goes forth, the first thing that he does, he goes to these two teachers. Yeah, two teachers in ancient India. One was called Alara Kalama. The other one was called Uddhakarama Buddha. And so you go to a place... Uh, to those uh, people who already have a very high reputation for being very highly attained, uh, who already have some degree of insight, uh, who already have a profound understanding of meditation and all of these kind of things, uh, yeah, you go to find a good teacher, first of all. Uh, this is what the Buddha shows. Even the Buddha did that, let alone anyone else. Uh, and then he follows those teachings of those people, uh, and he takes that teaching all the way to the end point that they teach, uh, and this is where the radicalism of the Buddha comes again. Yeah. Then he says, after achieving these extremely profound states of meditation, and India at that time was a very spiritual society. There were people who meditated in the forest, who achieved the most profound meditation that is possible for a human being, that was already attain attainable. 
And please don't underestimate these states. Yes, in Buddhism we go beyond that, but these states have, if you achieve something like this, basically you tend to think that you have come to the end of what is possible as a human being. You tend to think that you have achieved the meaning of life because that's what it feels like in these kind of states. You tend to think that you have unified with God. You tend to think that this is so blissful that there cannot possibly be any bliss beyond this. And so for the, almost everyone in the world, if you get to this point, you are satisfied. You are more than satisfied. You bow down to these teachers and say, thank you for showing me the meaning of life. That's what you, what you do. And it takes someone like the Buddha, someone who is really radical, someone who is willing to investigate in the deepest possible way to understand that even these states ultimately are not really satisfactory. And the reason why they are not satisfactory is because they, believe, they lead to just another rebirth. And then that rebirth leads to another rebirth. And it doesn't get you off the problem of life and death and old age, re-death re-death, 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 and eventually you may come back again as a human being and you have to start all over again on this path. And the Buddha says he rejects the highest achievements that humanity were able to achieve at that time. He rejected that to go even deeper. So you can see here the consistency in the radicalism of the Buddha. First of all, he gives up lay life and just walks off into the forest by himself to find the answer to death. He has this very kind of very remarkable thing to do. No one does that. Then he takes the existing um, spiritual teachings, practices them all the way to the end, rejects that too. So this is kind of the, the thing, and it gives us an idea how radical sometimes it is necessary to be to really take the spiritual teachings all the way. Then the Buddha-to-be goes off and practices ascetic practices, or I should rather say um, not ascetic practices so much as the tormenting of the body, self-mortification it is often called in the suttas, as how it's translated. And then he practices that. This was kind of the second way in ancient India to achieve awakening. Either you had very profound meditation or you practiced this very uh, austerity, torturing the body basically, what, 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 was, what, what it was about. And it takes that all the way to, to the extreme. Yeah? He's about to die here. And then when it's taken that all the way to extreme, he rejects that too. He rejects everything. He rejects all the spiritual paths in ancient India. Now he's standing on ground zero. Yeah? What to do now? And that is when he has this beautiful insight. And this is, you know, these things that happen when you let go of everything, you realize something doesn't work. That is when the insights arise. Could there be another path to awakening here? And that is when yeah, he thinks back at his time under the rose apple tree when he was a child. When as a child under the rose apple tree he thinks back, at that time I had a state of samadhi, a jhana state. Could that be the path to awakening here? And the knowledge arose in me, yes, that is the path to awakening here. And then that is what he used then to enable his awakening to happen here. But again, this is something really, really radical, and I think it's very difficult to, again, understand how, what is actually going on here. There's two things that is very interesting about this. First of all, you will notice that he achieved the jhana state as a child. He had no spiritual practice. He didn't know what he was doing. He was sitting at the root of a tree, waiting for his father to finish his work. He was doing nothing. And when you do nothing, what happens? If you really do nothing, uh, you attain deep samadhi. That is really fascinating, isn't it? It says something to us about how meditation actually is achieved. And it tells you that all the trying that we do probably gets in the way. As a child, you sit at the root of a tree. As a child, you're not doing anything. You're just sitting there, kind of waiting, being patient. That is the thing, right? Being patient. And then it happens all by itself. And so that is already a very beautiful teaching right there about what actually makes meditation work. But the other very interesting thing that comes out of this particular episode is this conundrum that is often talked about in Buddhist circles, that 
Even though the Buddha practices even deeper meditation under his two teachers that I just talked about before, still he recalls the time as a child. Why is it that he doesn't recall this time under his two teachers? Why does he recall the time as a child? And the answer probably is that when he was practicing under his two teachers, he also had the views of those teachers. And those views were views about how the universe has an underlying consciousness, an underlying reality about how we want to attain the supreme Atman, the supreme self, the supreme god of the world. In other words, those attainments were conjoined with wrong view. And that wrong view is so strong and so powerful that those attainments are tainted by that wrong view. And it's impossible to see how those attainments could lead to anything good because the wrong view that came with them was so powerful. And so he needed to go back to an experience when he was a child when he didn't have any views. Yeah, as a small child, you have no views. You're not tainted by some sort of uh, idea or ideology or anything at all. Uh, your mind is pure and bright uh, and clean, and you can look at that experience and see it in a neutral way rather than it being imbued with some kind of misunderstanding about the nature of reality. Uh, and it shows us the danger of views. Uh, it shows us how powerful those views are, how conditioning they are, and how careful we should be in our own lives about views. Yeah, how they come, how they infiltrate everything, how they block us from seeing reality, how they uh, taint our experiences in ordinary life and uh, stop us really from practicing the path in the right way. Yeah. So even the Buddha-to-be, yeah, the most powerful spiritual individual in human history, yeah, even he had this was not able to use those experiences in the right way because of the wrong view. And then the Buddha says, okay, so I need to practice these deep meditations. How do I do that? Well, I have to have some food. Yeah, I have to eat because I'm so amazed I can't possibly you know, live on this body. So he gets some of the famous rice porridge. Yeah, not, so not rice porridge, the milk rice, the kiribat. I don't know if anyone of you here is from Sri Lanka, you probably maybe have a Sri Lankan background. Kiribat is milk rice. Yeah? If you ever go to Sri Lanka, you can kind of have, get the food of the Buddha. Yeah? It's kind of really cool. Huh? And so he has some of that. This uh, lady called Sujata gives him the kiribat. Uh, and then he goes back to his five friends. Yeah? He has five people who are practicing with him. Huh? And they see that he's been eating here. Huh? And because he has been eating here, huh, they reject him because he's no longer practicing the ascetic practices. So his five last friends in the world leave him. Now there is nobody. He has left the household life, all his family behind. He has left all the spiritual practices that existed in India. He had five friends. Now they leave. Now there's only the Buddha left. This is a very, a very solitary kind of thing to be a Buddha. And then when finally everything goes, you have let go of pretty much everything in the world, that is when the possibility of awakening happens. And then, based on those profound meditations, the jhanas, and this probably took a long time, one of the interesting things about the biography of the Buddha is that it did not happen in one night, as sometimes you, it is claimed to have happened. When you look at some of the suttas, the Buddha was struggling with his meditation. This is one of the things that comes out of the beautiful sutta, the Upakilesa Sutta in the Majjhima 128, where the Buddha says that he was struggling. Yeah, he had these lights in meditation. He was seeing visions in his meditation. But as he was seeing the lights and the visions in meditation, they would fade away. And then the Buddha describes why they would fade away. And they would fade away for all the same reasons as our meditation fades away. So if you have ever had some seeing something in a meditation, if you ever had the light and it wasn't stable and it didn't stay, or you're having problems of whatever kind in meditation, you are in very good company. The Buddha to be also had problems in his meditation. Isn't that kind of reassuring? I think that's incredibly reassuring. Even the greatest meditators in the world find this path challenging and find it difficult. The Buddha to be. Anuruddha, Anuruddha, one of the greatest monks in the history of Buddhism, he too had similar kind of problems. 
And so we should remember this, yeah, and remember that actually this path is challenging. You shouldn't expect to be getting jhanas straight away. If you get jhanas straight away, they are not jhanas. That's basically the answer. Yeah. And so the Buddha then comes back, yeah, and he probably spends quite a bit of time, yeah, making his body strong again, eating a few meals over a few days, building up the meditation, and eventually using that meditation then to recall his past lives. Yeah? Again, this idea of remembering past lives being incredibly important for understanding this. And then understanding, that kind of gives you the big bird's eye view of existence. It gives you a sense of what really is meaningful in this world. Understanding the laws of Kama and eventually making the breakthrough to full awakening itself. Understanding the Four Noble Truths, the Dukkha and uh, the path and the ending of Dukkha, which of course is Nirvana itself. Uh, and at that point, uh, the Buddha has discovered the meaning of life. Uh, at that point, he understands uh, stillness, peace. Uh, he understands the ending of craving. Uh, and the ending of craving is the same as the discovery of meaning. Uh, because as long as you have desires and craving, you are going somewhere. Uh, you are heading somewhere. Uh, when all craving is given up, uh, it is because the contentment the happiness, the joy, the understanding of the existence is so profound that there is nowhere else to go. And when there is nowhere else to go, by definition, you have discovered the meaning of life. And that is what the Buddha discovered. And by following that path, following the same example, starting out with the simple contemplations of the reality of life, we too can do the same. Okay. Let me talk to you tonight about the life of the Buddha to be here. So, well, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nikki has been waiting to ask you a question. Is it okay for her to unmute now? Please, 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 yeah. Hi, Ajahn. Can you hear me? I can hear you very well, yeah, please. Um, yeah. You got me here, Boston. Yeah. Sorry, I'm so excited. I couldn't meditate. I'm just excited to see you. <laughs> I wanted to ask you a question. Yeah. Interestingly, you've been talking about probably um, I was diagnosed. I had a diagnosis of lung cancer. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah, so this talk is nothing. Yeah. Um, as you were talking about it, it brought. I mean, I've been a meditator and a Buddhist for eight years. So absolutely believe that training has brought me to this point of being able to at least I've only been recently getting what karma and rebirth is. Yeah. My goodness, I got that before <laughs> before my diagnosis. Yeah. Now I'm okay. I keep having to tell the world and um, quote Buddha, my body may be sick but my mind does not have to be because yeah. the world around me is not understanding why I'm not I have moments, of course, I get really upset. Yeah. It's uncurable, is what they say. You can't cure me, but they that chemo in the 24. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to ask the why question. <laughs> That's what I've decided to do. I'm not going to ask my neighbours or the nurses. I'm going to ask, of course, the nurses, but I'm going to ask, I want to ask you, Adjan, yeah. very briefly, I know it's at the end. I think you've answered the question really, haven't you, in the talk? But we try to, let's hear the question one more time. Let's hear what it is. Eh? The question, I was, yeah, I didn't ask it. The question, sorry, didn't hear me. <laughs> the question would be, I've done, I was going to ask him, how would you, I'm more about right views about this, yeah. probably. The right view about this? Uh, okay. So the right, the right view is that nothing has gone wrong. Yeah. Nothing has gone wrong. Yeah. Life is very, very uncertain. Yeah? Yeah? So nothing has gone wrong. It is just the nature of reality. Yeah? And if you understand that nothing has gone wrong, then you can find maybe a little bit more peace with what is happening to you. It is very painful. Most people find this really, really difficult. And it would be a miracle if you didn't find it difficult. Yeah? But this is a great opportunity to grow spiritually. And if you take it in the right way, and if you use it for that, it can be, the weird thing is that it can become a blessing in disguise. This is the weird thing about this. So use it, use it wisely in this way. Yeah, nothing has gone wrong. Life is so incredibly uncertain. And it does not mean that you have done anything 
bad in the past or anything like that because human life is sometimes it is short sometimes it is long sometimes the fact that you've been born as a human means that you can you know sometimes you just die early here and so so don't think of it sometimes people say it means one has done something bad in the past everyone has done bad things in the past so it's kind of completely irrelevant anyway it's the wrong way to think about these things this is an opportunity to learn compassion when you feel the pain that you are going through, you can have compassion for other people and of course for yourself as well at the same time. Yeah? This is the nature of existence. Existence is painful. And because existence is painful, you can learn more compassion for the world. And as you are learning compassion, you're building up huge good qualities for yourself. And then when you die, you get a good rebirth and you wonder, maybe I should have died even earlier because this is quite nice to get reborn in this way. Yeah? And then you kind of start to see things in an entirely different way. It is like the, the world gets turned upside down and death suddenly doesn't seem like such a terrible thing anymore. And so move in this way, in this direction. Yeah? It's going to take time. I mean, I can say it now, but you have to internalize this for yourself, you know, slowly, slowly, slowly over time. And as you do that, you will, uh, maybe one day you will start to see these things as a, as a, as a blessing in disguise. And that would a wonderful thing that would be if you're able to turn it around like that. Uh. Great. Uh, thank you, Ajahn. There's a couple of questions in the chat now. Could, could I read them for you? Please, that'd be wonderful. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to ask... Uh, Ajahn, about how he let go of his lay life, things like status, degrees, positions, and the hard one, hardest one of all, family. <laughs> did, did you plan this step by step, or does it just happen gradually? I, I've, I, the last one was like a general question. I would say it varies a lot from person to person, how it happens. So don't don't think that there is a right way of doing this. There is your way and then there's other people's ways. But what I can say is what ha how it happened to me. And uh, how it happened to me is that I used to think when I was younger, you know, starting out in monastic life, I used to think that uh, the reason I became a monk is because I'm such a wise and smart person. Yeah, because wise people, smart people, they become Buddhist monks, right? So, and so that's what I used to think. And then one day I realized actually, I'm probably just really conceited. So maybe I should look more deeply into this. And uh, I think in my case, it is because I think I've been a monk or a nun in a past life. So for me, it is just a continuation of what I did in the past. Yeah? It's like a habit, if you like. Yeah? But I reckon it's a really good habit, and so I'm quite happy with that habit. Uh, so that is kind of my story. So for me, it happened kind of naturally. I'd always had an interest in the spiritual things, and I, I kind of knew, I think, fairly early on that I was going to end up in this, this way here. And uh, so, uh, but for other people, it's different. So you follow along. Yeah? What I would recommend people to do is if you have some inclination to become a monastic, yeah, go and live at different monasteries. Yeah? Never think that one monastery has all the answers. It depends on what kind of works for you. So try a few different places. Definitely come to Perth. Yeah, absolutely come here. Don't miss this monastery, but you can also go to a few other ones. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> but certainly come here. Uh, and what I would recommend you to do is when you choose a monastery, choose on certain, I would, the criteria that I would recommend you to choose on. Well, first of all, it should be a place where they teach you the teachings of the Buddha, right? So we have the based on the teachings of the Buddha. It should be a place where they practice properly the monastic, the monastic rules, yeah? So you're actually living the monastic life properly. But thirdly, and the most important one to me, is it should be a place where you feel at ease, where you feel that you are, the community is friendly, where you feel that you are not, you know, some communities you may not feel, that may not feel natural to you. And if it doesn't feel that you can be at ease, your meditation is not going to work. And if your meditation doesn't work, monastic life doesn't really work. So the, how you, ultimately how you feel about it, I think is the most important thing, yeah. Thank you for your answer, Ajahn. Uh, one more. Which Nikaya narrates the time when our Buddha uh, left his family members? 
uh, it is found in a number of suttas. Uh, uh, the, if you go to the Majjhima Nikaya, the, the middle length sayings of the Buddha, there's a number of suttas there that talk about this. Uh, the two best ones are number 26 and number 36. Uh, 26 is known as the Arya Pariyasana Sutta, the Noble Search. And number 36 is known as the Maha Satchaka Sutta, the greatest sutta to Satchaka. Uh, but there are other suttas as well that talk about this. So another one is... I can just let me just t say the ones in the middle length sayings because that, then you have it, everything in one in one book, so to speak. One of them is Majjhima number four, the Baya Bhairava Sutta, the Fear and Dread Sutta. It's a very nice one. Another one is the one I mentioned before about the Buddha having problems in his meditation. It's called the Upakilesa Sutta, Corruptions. Majjhima 128 is that one. Uh, then there is the, also a f one sutta where the Buddha talks about his wrong views before his awakening. Uh, Majjhima Nikaya 85, the, uh, the uh, Bodhiraja Kumara Sutta, the sutta to Prince Bodhi. Uh, Majjhima Nikaya 85. Um, there are more suttas as well about the life of the Buddha before his awakening, but uh, um, maybe not so important. I, I've given you, I think, some of the most important ones. Uh, there, are, there are further ones, but uh, I think I will leave it, uh, leave it at that. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Well, thank you very much this evening, Ajahn. It's um, reached the magic hour. Um, so, would you like to say a few words to close this evening? Or? Yeah, why, why not? I'm always happy to say a few words. <laughs> I'm going to put on my glasses. Put on my glasses again, so I can see see all of you out there. So, as always, been wonderful to see you all. Always wonderful to share Dhamma with uh, good friends. I, I think we are so lucky in the uh, modern day to have you know these kind of communities that makes it possible for all of us to work together and to function together. So it's a wonderful thing, and uh, I am always delighted to see people taking the Dhamma seriously and practicing this thing seriously. So for this reason, it's, uh, it's always wonderful to be with you. Uh, um, I think we can be nice to, uh, just very quickly, one of the things that we do very often around the world is to share the merits of the occasion. Uh, and what this means, sharing the merits, especially with the departed, it only takes about two minutes. Uh, and so I will do some quick chanting, and then we'll do the chanting to the Buddha, pay respect to the Buddha at the very end. Uh, so just to finish these things off. Uh, so <clears throat> here we go. This is the sharing of the merit. So just uh, tell your departed relatives, wherever they may be, that you're sharing this merit of today with them. Edang men yate nang hotu sukita hontu nyatayo Edang men yate nang hotu sukita hontu nyatayo Edang men yate nang hotu sukita hontu nyatayo and let's just pay respect to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha just to finish off. Arahang Sama Sambuddho Bhagava Buddhang Bhagavantang Abhivademi Svakato Bhagavata Dhammo Tamang namasame Supati panno bhagavato Savaka sango Sangang namami Okay, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye -bye. <laughs> yeah, see you next time. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, Thank bye. You. bye. <laughs> Very good. Excellent. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>